like to welcome you to our program. This is part seven in our ongoing series in the book of Romans. Today we're going to be looking in Romans chapter four, verses one through 13, as the apostle Paul seeks to discuss the experience of Abraham, an experience that all Jewish listeners would understand. And then, of course, as he weaves in his understanding of circumcision, the Apostle Paul then brings the Gentile world in as well. Before we look at these interesting and fascinating subjects, let's kneel for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we're grateful for your love. We're grateful for your truth. We're grateful for this time. We pray for the Holy Spirit to lead us, to bless us as we share together. In Jesus' name, amen. Romans chapter 4. Let's take a look at it. Just a little review of Romans 3, because obviously... This was a letter that Paul wrote. There were no divisions into chapters. So let's review the last comments that Paul made as we go into Romans chapter 4. Point number one, forgiveness comes through faith in Christ alone. Point number two, righteousness or obedience to the law of God, because that's what righteousness is. Righteousness is defined in Scripture as the law of God. So righteousness by faith is obedience to the Ten Commandments through faith in Jesus Christ. Righteousness in our lives comes through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Boasting over good deeds has no place in the life of a Christian. Well, how can there be boasting in the life of a Christian when they realize that without Jesus, they receive no forgiveness and they have no power to do right? Wherein can there be boasting? Only in Christ alone. Finally, the law of Ten Commandments and the gospel of Christ go hand in hand. You can't split them. You can't have one without the other. The Jews in the first century, they had a gospel based on law, on obedience to law, and they rejected the Messiah. Today in our world, we have the exact opposite extreme the world claims to be following Jesus Christ, but they throw out his law of Ten Commandments. So again, friend, down here at the end of time, we have the opposite deception that racked the Jews. They were all about law. We're all about the mercy of God. That's what we're all about today. So we reject law in our exaltation of Christ. And friend, we can't do that. The law and the gospel go together, just as it did in the Hebrew sanctuary service in Leviticus chapter 4. The law convicted of sin pointed to Christ that the people might be justified by faith. Romans 4, 1 to 3, Paul picks up his argument. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? If Abraham was justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Romans 4, 1 to 3. To illustrate his point on faith and righteousness, 
Paul cites the experience of Abraham to explain or exemplify his position. How was Abraham forgiven? How did Abraham receive the mercy of God? Was it by works that he did? Or was it by faith in the promise of God? Which one was it, friend? That's Paul's whole question here. How was Abraham justified? Was it by works or was it through faith? And so this is basically what Romans chapter 4 is all about. Was Abraham justified by faith or was he justified by works? That's the big question. Paul cites Genesis 15 verse 6 that says, And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. This was Paul's proof that for Abraham, righteousness came by faith. In spite of apparent odds, to the contrary, Abraham believed that God could and would provide a son for him. Now, of course, Abraham and Sarah failed a little while after this. They failed. And they sought to carry out God's promise by their own works. And that always, friend, is sure to fail. Because our works account for nothing. We must submit to God's will. And that is our work, to submit to the authority of Christ in our lives and allow him to work out his will not our will but his will in us and so in Genesis 15 the Bible says that Abraham believed God Abram believed God that God would provide him a son now obviously Abraham or Abram was quite old he was getting up there and so was his wife, Sarai. They were both getting up there. But Abraham, at this point in his life, he was about 75 years old. He believed that God would do what he said. Many years later, <laughs> James came along and apparently contradicted Paul or balanced him. Because James said the exact opposite of what Paul said. James said that Abraham was justified by works of law. James said, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect? The scripture was fulfilled which saith Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only? James 2, 19 to 24. You see, folk, Martin Luther looked at these comments in the book of James and he said, James, the book of James does not belong in the New Testament canon. He said it should be abolished. He said it's a straw gospel. He says, a man is not justified by his works. When in actuality, friend, and, and we can understand where Luther was coming from because Luther was coming out of a dark age of nearly a thousand years of papal darkness in which people earned forgiveness by pilgrimages, by indulgences, by penance. 
And Luther wanted nothing to do with that. And nor, nor does the Apostle Paul, and nor does the Apostle James. What is James's argument here? Is he really, is this really a book that doesn't belong in the New Testament canon as Luther claimed? No, friend. James is just saying that after a person has accepted of the graciousness and of the wonder of the love of God through Jesus Christ, and he recognizes that God is gracious and loving and kind, the person wants to submit their life to him and to follow what he says. And James calls that submission to the Lord and the following of what he says, James calls that works. And he says, wasn't Abraham justified by works when he offered up Isaac? Well, folk, Abraham offering up his son showed that he loved God and that God was truly working in his life and that he was in submission to God's authority. And by Abraham's act of sacrificing of his son, or the almost sacrificing of his son Isaac, there in Genesis chapter 22, that showed that Abraham's faith was a pure faith that Abraham loved God and was in submission to his authority. So his act of taking Isaac to Mount Moriah was a great act of faith in God's love. You know, as, as the psalmist says in Psalms 36 and verse 7, it says, How excellent, how excellent is thy loving kindness, O God! Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. You see, the psalmist saw the goodness, the greatness of God, and he said, your greatness is so wonderful. Therefore, I will put my trust under the shadow of your wings. That's what Abraham was doing here. Abraham recognized in his life that when he had sought to carry out God's will by himself, in his own devising, that it had only ended up in ruin and guilt and suffering and pain. And then Abraham recognized the goodness of God and said, I'm going to follow you because your way is the best way. The same spirit that inspired both Paul and James is not contradictory at all. It's not contradicting the Lord. Paul's point is that forgiveness and righteousness come through faith in Jesus Christ. James's point is that true faith is manifest in works of righteousness. Well, isn't that what James said? He said the devils claim to have faith. The devils say, oh, I believe. But there's no resulting submission to God's authority. So their faith is really a false faith. And that's Paul and James. That's James' whole argument. True faith in the righteousness of Christ will be seen in a person's life. And isn't that what Jesus said in John 15? That somebody who is abiding in the vine will bring forth fruit? It's a natural thing. Any branch that's connected to the parent stock of an orange tree is going to produce oranges. That's just the way it is. Even a city slicker like myself understands that. 
We're forgiven by faith in Jesus Christ alone. We're empowered to do right through faith in Jesus Christ alone. This is Paul's focus. Once we've been forgiven and have experienced God's goodness and power, we will reveal our connection to heaven by works of righteousness. That was James's focus. They're just simply looking at the same coin from the opposite side. And the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul, in the book of Romans, says the same thing. In Romans 3, verse 31, we read it last time. He said, Do we then make void the law through faith? Now that I have accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, do I throw away the law of God? Paul asked. He said, May it never be. That's impossible. Meganota, he said. We establish the law. So the Apostle Paul taught the same message that James did, just with a little different approach. That's all. Romans 4, 4 to 8, Paul said, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. If I'm trying to earn God's forgiveness by my works, I will continually fall short because I can never meet the requirements of God by myself. That's impossible. That's like asking my son when he was a little boy to say, okay, bud, here's a glass of water. It's right here. And he's down there. And I said, now, take the glass of water and get a nice drink. Friend, that only produces frustration. That only produces agony. Because here's this child who so desperately wants to please his dad, but he can never reach that standard. He can't get there. So what does God do? God reaches down and picks up his children, and he lifts us up so we can get a drink of water. Friend, you and I cannot reach the glass. But God has provided a way whereby he will lift us up so we can take a refreshing drink. That's the same message of Ephesians chapter 2. The Bible says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he hath loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, for by grace are ye saved, and hath made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then Paul goes on and there in Ephesians 2 and he says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So friend, we are never forgiven by God because of something we have done. It's all because of what Jesus has done. And we are forgiven. And in that state of forgiveness and thankfulness 
and appreciation for God's abundant mercy toward us. We want to submit our lives to him so that his character can be revealed in our lives. I will always owe a debt to heaven. On the other hand, I can look by faith to Christ and his merits can satisfy my debt. I can accept his righteousness in my place and receive forgiveness. Forgiveness. Just as Jacob, as he fled from his parents' home, never to see his mother again, there's a consequence, friend. There's a pain. There's a hurt in doing things our own way. But God revealed to Jacob a way whereby he could be forgiven. It was that ladder let down from heaven, even Jesus Christ. My good deeds or being a good guy aren't going to cut it. Isaiah 64 says, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Our good works stink, friend. It's about time we realize and acknowledge that and look to Jesus. David's joy was not found in what he did, but was found in whom he trusted. He trusted that Christ could forgive even him. We all remember the story. It's not a pretty story. David committed sin with Bathsheba. Moral impurity licentiousness, lust. And then he had her husband killed, the faithful warrior Uriah. And after Nathan came in to him, David didn't justify his wrong. David asked for forgiveness. He said, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness." According to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. And God, who is rich in mercy, extended forgiveness to his fallen child. Friend, did that mean that there would be no consequences for David's act? No, there was a consequence. As Nathan told David, David would lose four of his sons. That's what 2 Samuel chapter 12 tells us. He would restore fourfold David lost four of his sons from his own crimes of immorality. Micah asked, Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? Or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? And what is the answer, friend? Are we going to appease God by some work of ours? by oil or sacrifices or long trip or chastising our body? No. No, it's not going to happen. God wants us to accept of his abundant mercy. Abundant mercy. 
David says, you don't desire sacrifice. You don't delight in burnt offering. You want a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. God wants a heart that says, I've sinned. I've done wrong. It's not somebody else's fault. I'm not making excuses. I'm not going to blame somebody else. It's on me. It's on me. Romans 4, 9 to 13. Paul now uses an experience in the life of Abraham, a very clear-cut experience, circumcision. Cometh this blessedness, this blessedness of justification by faith. Does it come upon the circumcision only? Is it only for the Jew that has been circumcised? Or upon the uncircumcision also? Oh my, that's a good question. Can this forgiveness extend to every child of humanity or is it only for a select few? Is it for those that are predestined or is it extended to everyone? Is it for Jew and Gentile alike? Paul says we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. Well, when was it reckoned to him? Paul asked the obvious question, how was it then reckoned? Was it reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Did Abraham receive that gift from God when he was circumcised? Or did he receive it after he was circumcised? When, when did that blessing come? Well, we know that Abraham believed God and righteousness was granted to him. That's in Genesis 15. Circumcision didn't come until Genesis chapter 17. So Paul answers his question. Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised. That he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. Abraham is the father of the faithful. He believed God when he was not circumcised. And in that faith, God forgave that erring man. Paul's argument here, friend, is, is that Abraham is the father of the faithful. Abraham is the father of those who recognize their spiritual need for Jesus Christ, Jew or Gentile. Doesn't matter. And the father of circumcision, to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, he had been yet uncircumcised. The promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Now, friend, what does Paul mean when he says, through the law? Is Paul denigrating the Ten Commandments there? What is Paul contrasting in this passage? Paul is saying that righteousness does not come through works of law. Because that's impossible for us to obey the law by ourselves. Paul's whole argument is, is that works of law justifies nobody. 
but righteousness or obedience to law comes through faith. That's Paul's argument here. Is the message and precious experience of Christ's forgiveness and righteousness in the life only for those who are circumcised? Is this experience only for Sabbath keepers? Or can others experience this too? Who's it for, friend? Well, Paul said it's for everyone who has faith in Jesus Christ. Even as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. This is Galatians 3, 6 to 9. Same, same concept. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel to Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Was Abraham forgiven and trusting in Christ's righteousness after he was circumcised? Or was he trusting in Christ prior to circumcision? He had this glorious experience before he was circumcised. Friend, the circumcision that Abraham experienced in Genesis 17 showed that Abraham had come to a place in his life where he had totally renounced himself, totally given up on his own efforts to follow God's will. And he was absolutely dependent as a little child on a loving father, a loving father. Circumcision simply represented the outward sign of the inward experience that he already had. Circumcision represented the cutting away of sin and evil from the life through faith and the righteousness of Christ. Abraham had this experience before he was circumcised. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 6 says, And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed, to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul that thou mayest live. So circumcision represented the cutting away of our efforts to save ourselves. Cutting away those efforts to follow God our way. That's what circumcision was all about. Our grave danger today is to think that some outward act of obedience gains God's approval of me. Wrong. We're not accepted before God because of anything we're do, we do. We're accepted before God because we have faith in Jesus Christ. The promise came for the, those who were of faith. In the context of through the law, Paul means that outward acts of obedience do not gain God's acceptance. They simply reveal the genuineness of the faith professed, as James already told us. Precious, precious chapter here in Romans chapter 4. We'll pick up the rest of Romans 4 in our next program together. Until then, friends, may we abide under the shadow of his wings. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this study in Romans chapter 4. Thank you that we can depend on you not upon ourselves. 
Strengthen each one of us to total dependence upon your righteousness to do in our hearts what we can't do. In Jesus' name, amen.